Okay, turning now to um, Shandor Ferenczi. Um, in order to uh, study Ferenczi, uh, to understand Ferenczi's significance, we again have to go back to a piece of, of, of the history of Freud's work that we haven't addressed as of yet. And I'm talking about Freud's original um, development of the so-called seduction theory and, and then his rejection and radical revision of it. So here we have a chart. Uh, Freud, um, you know, uh, didn't want to be a physician. He trained as a neurologist. He was forced to take his medical degree because anti-Semitism prevented him from having the professorship of physiology at the University of Vienna that he wanted. Um, so he was forced to take a medical degree. To do that he had to specialize. He'd been cutting up eels, studying the nervous system of eels, so he figured, well, I've been working on nervous systems, maybe I'll be a neurologist and specialize in diseases of the nervous system. Uh, he hangs out his shingle. At least 50% of the people in his waiting room have nothing wrong with them neurologically. Why are they there? Because they're nervous. And so it goes, it makes sense to them to go to a nerve doctor, a neurologist. They're having nervous breakdowns. They're anxious, in other words. They're hysterics. Three types of hysteria. Uh, um, conversion hysteria, like the famous glove anesthesia that doesn't follow the pathways of the nerves, but the mental concept of the hand. Um, phobia, in which there's an irrational fear of a particular thing. And anxiety hysteria, nowadays called panic attacks. These are the three main categories of hysteria. Freud was initially working very much with conversion hysteria. Um, he, his teacher gets him a travel grant to go to Paris where he studies under Charcot uh, who is using direct hypnotic suggestion both to create and to cure hysterics. He takes a normal person, hypnotizes them, tells them when they come out of the trance their arm will be paralyzed, come out of the trance the arm is paralyzed. Uh, or take someone who presents with hysterical paralysis, hypnotize them, tell them that when they come out of the trance the arm will no longer be paralyzed, it's cured. The problem is you get symptom substitution. Tomorrow the paralysis will be back or it'll be in a different arm or a different leg. Um, anyway, that's direct hypnotic suggestion. Uh, Freud um, also learns something from Charcot one night after the women have withdrawn from the dining room into the uh, and the men have pulled out the uh, uh, taken off their ties and pulled out the cigars and the brandy Charcot who's had a few says in these cases of hysteria toujours toujours it's always the bedroom Freud doesn't something is happening or not happening in the bedroom Freud doesn't know what to deal with this he files it away a few years later, he hears another a Viennese neurologist who's worked a lot with hysteria say, if I were to write on my prescription pad the prescription that these hysterical women really require, I would write penis normalis dosim repetitor, a normal penis applied repetitively. Freud puts that with the toujours, it's always the bedroom, and he's thinking sex uh, has something to do with all of this. Then he's told the story by Joseph Breuer, uh, a more senior Viennese neurologist who ten years earlier treated uh, 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 Anna O, oh, whose real name is Bertha Pappenheim, by direct hypnotic suggestion. Uh, and one day he hypnotized her and was about to plant the post-hypnotic suggestion that her symptoms would be gone and she interrupts him, insists on just talking, and he lets her talk. And her talk goes to the remembering with a great deal of emotion a, a traumatic scene. Thus is born the so-called cathartic method. You still hypnotize, you don't plant post-hypnotic suggestions, you just let the patient talk. The patient remembers some painful scene and relives it with feeling, and this method is still used nowadays with uh, victims of, of trauma, we, the, 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 hypno, the hypnosis is induced not with a watch, your eyes are growing heavy, but with low dosages of sodium amytal or sodium pentothal. 
Um, you don't give them enough that they go to sleep, but they go into a kind of a hypnoid state, and you, they remember the trauma. Uh, again, with affect, there's a catharsis. Um, this works better, but this, you still get the symptom substitution. Uh, Freud hated it because he was a lousy hypnotist and not everyone could be hypnotized and he wanted to be a scientist and understand the causes of things. These hypnotic methods will sometimes get rid of the symptoms, but this is a purely cosmetic cure. Freud wasn't interested in curing very much, he was interested in knowing. He was a scientist fundamentally and so just making the symptoms go away wouldn't have uh, satisfied him anyway. Uh, he then, on a second trip to France, to Nancy, he saw Bernheim uh, take a class of, of students, he asked for a volunteer, Kid hip, uh, agreed to be hypnotized, Bernheim plants a post-hypnotic suggestion, um, uh, when you come out you'll remember nothing of what I'm saying, but as my lecture goes on, at some point you'll see me tug my earlobe, at which point you'll get up and go to the cloakroom and get your umbrella and come back and put it up. And he brings him out, he goes on with the lecture, he does the earlobe, the kid goes up, gets the umbrella, puts it up. At which point, Bernheim stops the lecture and approaches and says, My uh, young man, why on earth are you sitting in my lecture theater with the umbrella? And the student starts saying what nowadays later came to be known as rationalizations. We know why he's really doing it. He apparently doesn't know why he's doing it. He's instead talking about the fluorescent lighting or whatever. Uh, but Bernheim starts badgering him and says, no, that is not the real reason and you know perfectly well. What is it? No, I don't know. Yes, you do. And sure enough, the guy starts acknowledging what really happened. You told me to do this. And Freud is watching all of this and saying, at first the kid's unconscious of why he's doing what he's doing. But if you pressure him, it can become conscious. And now Freud begins to practice the pressure technique. So he's no longer inducing trance. The patient's lying on the couch. Uh, Freud is asking about when the symptoms first occurred. And, 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 and eventually the patient finds nothing more to say. The associations dry up. Freud reaches over and puts his hand on the patient's head and says, when I remove my hand, a thought will occur to you that will prove to be useful for our investigations. He removes his hand and often there's an association. This is the pressure technique. Finally, a patient says, stop interrogating me, stop pressuring me and just let me talk. And Freud hears this and does this. Now we have psychoanalysis. We have free association. No physical contact, simple invitation to say everything and we've got psychoanalysis. So what happens, Breuer and Freud, they want to write a report on what they've learned from their work with hysterics and in 1893 they publish an article called The Preliminary Communication which later, two years later in 1895, formed the first chapter of their book Studies on Hysteria. And this they both signed, the 1893 article and they say that hysteria is rooted in, um, uh, 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 in, 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 in forgotten events, in, in, in forgotten memories of traumas, forgotten traumas. Uh, that's as far as they go. Two years later, in, they publish studies on hysteria, but it's a weird book because only that first chapter is signed by both of them. Every other chapter is signed either Freud or Breuer because they're already disagreeing. Uh, what are the disagreements? Do you want to pause this? Okay. So they're already disagreeing with each other. Uh, two main disagreements. Uh, first, Breuer insists that the traumas have accidentally become unconscious. The traumatic s scene has slipped accidentally into the unconscious because at the time of the trauma the patient was in what Breuer called a hypnoid state, whatever that is. Freud says no, it, it didn't become accidentally unconscious, it was intentionally repressed from consciousness because it was unacceptable, guilt-inducing, anxiety, and, and painful. Uh, Breuer doesn't like this idea of repression, so you know that's their first. The second is the big disagreement, the thing that's 
repressed is sexual. The trauma is sexual. Freud is zeroing in. And this is making Breuer very nervous because his treatment of Anna O oh was a disaster. Uh, he tried to break off the treatment. He was called back to her bedside. He's a handsome older physician. She's a beautiful young woman. His wife is getting antsy because he's spending all this time with this young woman. And when he tries to break off the treatment, she calls him in a st he's called back to her bedside. She's in a state of pseudosiesis, hysterical pregnancy, and to Breuer's horror, she thinks she's giving birth to Joseph Breuer's baby. And to this day, I don't think we know the true story of what might have been going on between Breuer and Anna O. Oh. Uh, I'm pretty skeptical that a hysterical woman is going to think she's giving birth to this guy's baby unless something maybe a little fishy had gone on between that man and that patient. But that's just my speculation. Um, anyway, as Freud zeroes in on sex, Breuer is getting nervous. Uh, the following year, 1896, Freud goes before the Medical Society of Vienna and announces that he, Sigmund Freud, has discovered the cause of hysteria. It is the sexual seduction of children by an adult, often a father, an uncle, an older brother, the man next door. It's interesting he calls it the seduction theory. It makes it sound kind of gentle and nice, like the older man is kind of like uh, seducing. Um, this is a euphemism for what is more accurately described as child rape, or certainly child abuse. Uh, but nevertheless, Freud is zeroing in on abuse, even while calling it seduction. Um, okay, so his first theory of neurosis then in, in 1896 is that it is rooted in the external world, it's rooted in the external environment, the reality, uh, uh, and it involves the perversity of an adult, the child is an innocent victim of a perverted adult. This is a theory of abuse, the external world. The very following year, or after being almost laughed out of town in 1896 when he announces this, because the room is filled with older male physicians who have hysterical daughters. Hmm. Freud's theory is calling these guys perverts. This is not a popular theory. Freud begins to doubt himself, and he soon radically changes the theory. And silly people like Jeffrey Masson, uh, Mason, uh, Alice Miller, uh, to a lesser extent, but uh, you know they argued that Freud abandoned the truth about sexual abuse being the cause of hysteria because he was ambitious because he knew it was an unpopular theory. Uh, this, of course, is nonsense. Um, he had to radically revise this theory because it isn't true. And he knew it. Not all hysterics have been sexually abused. And many people who have been sexually abused never develop hysteria. So to say that the cause of hysteria is sexual abuse is just patent nonsense. Many who have been abused do not become hysterical, and many who are hysterical have never been abused. The theory had to be radically revised. Unfortunately, in realizing this and radically revising it, this is a pendulum. So from having had the pendulum way over on this extreme, Freud now allows the pendulum to swing all the way over to the opposite extreme, finding the roots of neurosis not in the external world of reality, but in the inner world of fantasy and desire. Instead of the child being an innocent victim of a perverted adult, the child is now the pervert. Freud's theory of infantile sexuality emerges. The child is polymorphous perverse, says Freud. Uh, the child's sexuality is incestuous. It doesn't respect the animal-human boundary. The child is deriving sexual pleasure from the whole body, oral, anal, whatever. Um, and uh, so now, instead of the perverted adult being blamed, it is the child who is really the origin, and Freud, of course, is focusing on the child's Oedipal incestuous desire. And it's because the child incestuously desired the parent that the child has generated a fantasy of the parent molesting the child. 
This did a lot of damage to women who really were abused and whose Freudian analysts said things like, my dear, it doesn't really matter, we'll never know what really happened, but it's the fact that you feel this happened is what we need to concentrate on, which, you know, she's already confused about what really happened and didn't, and the analyst is, 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 is now expressing a good deal of skepticism about these stories, and some, some of these stories were actually stories of real abuse that, that took place. On the other hand, many of the stories were fantasies. Uh, and so, you know, we can't afford to believe the child or disbelieve the child. So I remember when you were about six, you were coming home from BSS, coming down Dunvegan Road. You and I had been playing Lara Croft Tomb Raider on the <laughs> computer, and you announced, Dad, uh, I ran into Lara Croft on, on Dunvegan Road and she had this big house and, and it was full of uh, trampolines and ropes and, and I'm saying, that's a fantasy, right, Nick? No, Dad! It really <laughs> happened! You know, and I, I don't think you were lying. I think you half believed what you were saying. I mean, you cannot believe what kids say, but you can't disbelieve what kids say because sometimes what they say is true. And so we got this terrible problem of discernment once again. So having allowed the pendulum to swing too far to the inner world, Freud himself starts inching back, trying to find a middle ground, which I'm indicating here. In 1911, he introduces his paper about um, uh, um, uh, the reality testing um, and, and the reality principle. We're not just the pleasure principle, he adds the reality. He's trying to bring reality back in because he knew he threw it out too much. Certainly, uh, by the time we get to 1923 with ego psychology, and there's the ego's prime function, which is the testing of reality, Freud uh, realizes he's gone too far, uh, emphasizing wish and illusion, and he's trying to bring reality back in. The whole evolution of psychoanalysis since Freud has been an attempt to do justice to both sides, the real world and the inner world of fantasy and desire. Uh, uh, and as we'll see, Ferenczi plays a big uh, part in this. Um, at the bottom here, I'm simply trying to show how I think nowadays this is the way we perceive... Se oh, by the way, by allowing the swing to go too far to the inner world, this is what w many people have recognized as a creative error. It was an error, but it was a creative error because it put the idea of psychic reality on the map. The idea of an inner world of fantasy and desire. It put it on the map, but it overdid it. Okay, so here's how a, a contemporary view of psychic reality would be. This is a screen, a projection screen, but instead of being completely opaque or completely translucent like glass, it allows some light through. Um, um, and these are two different projectors. Um, each projecting a different movie onto the same screen. And so over here, what's being projected is Gone with the Wind. Over here, what's being projected is Casablanca. And what you see on the screen is a crazy mixture of Gone with the Wind and Casablanca. Okay, so this represents what's coming in from the external world. This represents what's coming in from the internal world. And so what we see on the screen is a crazy blend. And one way of conceiving of psychoanalytic, psychotherapeutic work is an attempt to sort out what's coming from reality, what came from, from wish and fear and, and, and distortion. The Kleinians would pretty much agree with this, because the Kleinian model is that of trying to sort out what's really real from what I'm projecting and what I'm distorting, so that how I, I come to know the contents of my inner world, so I can see how my inner world is getting confused with the outer world, and my reality testing is enhanced as a result. Okay, so now we come to Ferenczi, whose major significance was to realize that Freud had um, gone way overboard in uh, turning away from the reality of sexual abuse. 
um, from from this book, The Legacy of Shandor Ferency, edited by Lewis Aron and Adrian Harris in 1993, they write, Ferenczi can take his place now as one of the important parental figures in psychoanalysis of object relations theory directly in the work of the balance, e, uh, Michael and Enid Ballant, and passed on to Klein and Winnicott. Uh, ancestor of the interpersonalist tradition, carried explicitly through Eric Fromm and Clara Thompson, of self-psychology, of Lacanian work, and of some of the neo-Freudian tradition, represented in Europe by diverse figures such as Chasquet, Smergel, McDougall, and Green, and in America by Lowald and Ogden. So he initiated a whole uh, object relational tradition. Um, uh, Ferenczi was Melanie Klein's analyst, her first analyst. She then left Budapest and went to uh, Berlin where she was analyzed by Abraham, but the influence of Ferenczi upon her work is obvious. Uh, he, Ferenczi was also Ernest Jones's analyst, uh, John Rickman's analyst, and the analyst of Michael and Edith uh, Ballant. Um, so he plays a huge role in the evolution of British object relations, influences Fairbairn, Klein, Winnicott. Um, there's also a whole important political angle here. Juliet Mitchell has noted that the political and social climate of post-war Britain was one in which the restoration of family structure, and particularly the crucial role of mothering, was a high priority. Winnicott is a critical figure here. The children had been removed from London to escape the bombing. And so there was all of these children who had been separated traumatically from their mothers, from their families. And uh, in 1950, John Bowlby wrote Maternal uh, Care and Infant Mental Health for uh, the World Health Organization. And here are the, the roots of Bull what Bowlby will develop as attachment theory and the consequences of separation. Um, um, but there's this shift then to the maternal. Uh, that which Freud had left out is being filled in by, Fer by, by Ferenczi, Winnicott, Boldy, and so on. The whole pre uh, uh thing is being filled in gradually. Okay, um, just a few words about Ferenczi himself. Um, so he uh, is born in Miskolc, uh, Austria-Hungary. He moves to Budapest. His parents were Polish Jews. Uh, Freud lived from uh, 1856 to 1939. Ferenczi from 1873 to 1933. He died at age 59. He was 17 years younger than Freud, so he's a generation younger than Freud. And he's a Hungarian, he's not Viennese. And there's a huge cultural difference between Hungary and, and Vienna. Um, and there are these two schools of thought, the Hungarian school versus the Viennese school. Um, and in many ways, the Viennese won. Um, for the Hungarian school, uh, one's first, in, in, in analytic training, one's first supervisor should be one's own personal analyst, because the analyst knows your craziness, and knows therefore how that's going to affect your countertransference, and, and, and knows how best to help you um, get past your craziness to be able to work more objectively with the patient. To me, this always made enormous sense, the idea of the personal analyst as the first supervisor. And in fact, it still goes on, because when a person becomes a candidate in training, they're talking to their analyst four days a week about the struggles they're having with their patients. And most analysts are not going to refuse to discuss the candidate's cases with him, even, you know, they're not going to say, take that to your supervisor. I mean, they're counting on the supervisor to deal with it, but they're, they're, they're going to be involved. Um, so why not make it explicit? But anyway, the Viennese always insisted on the separation of the supervisor from the personal analyst, and that became the rule in the IPA. Um, the Hungarian school, and certainly Ferenczi, 
was highly emo he was a highly emotional man. Freud was a pretty aloof, cool, reserved intellectual, uh, formal. Um, uh, Ferenczi highly emotional and, and places a lot of emphasis on emotionality. Uh, Ferenczi wanted to cure, and someone is qu quoted here as saying he could have cured a horse. Uh, he just was an, a naturally talented therapist. Uh, sometimes analysts following the far more intellectual emphasis of Freud, you know, Freud didn't, wasn't interested in curing. A in fact, he said repeatedly he didn't think psychoanalysis was very good as a cure for anything. But what it did reveal was knowledge uh, as to the roots of the symptoms. Freud really wanted to know. You know the old statement, uh, um, uh, the therapy was successful, but the patient died. Uh, the, the Freud would say, yeah, the patient died, so what? The therapy was successful. We learned. <laughs> uh, Ferenczi wanted to cure people. Um, uh, you know, some psychoanalysts, in my humble opinion, forget that psychoanalysis is a form of psychotherapy. You know, it's not, it's not psychoanalysis for the sake of psychoanalysis. It's a method of therapy. Uh, well, that's, I'm more in tune with Ferenczi's thinking in that regard, you know, he, he really wanted to help, not just achieve insight. Um, Ferenczi emphasizes mothering and fathering. Uh, Freud's much, his style of therapy is much more the fathering style of therapy than the mothering style of therapy. Um, Ferenczi wanted to become much more active. Um, the Freudians tended to be much more passive the use of silence, reserve, minimal self-revealing, and so on. Um, early on, um, in one of his early papers, Ferenczi distinguished two types of, two, two methods for inducing hypnosis. Uh, by being the stern father, uh, you will listen to my voice, you will do what I say, this way of inducing hypnosis, the, author the authoritarian way of inducing hypnosis, the stern father. There's another way of inducing hypnosis, which is through the more soothing, coaxing, uh, encouraging, uh, uh, this would be the indulgent mother. For, uh, he distinguishes these two styles of hypnotic induction. And, um, and, and, over time, in, in his experiments with technique, he's, he's swinging a little bit from one to another. Sometimes he, he's being more the authoritarian father, other times he's being very much the encouraging mother. Obviously, both of these are necessary. Uh, an analyst to op operate uh, properly has to be able to, to, to be firm and have boundaries, and, and, but also has to be highly empathic. But um, Ferenczi's trying to experiment, and he's not satisfied with the one-sidedly intellectual fathering emphasis on insight, and he's, he, he, he takes the risk of varying his technique and, and exploring. Sometimes he goes so far that uh, instead of the authoritarian, uh, 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 rather undemocratic approach of some of the Freudians, he goes all the way to the point of mutual analysis, where in fact he's trading the role of analyst and analysand with the patient. I don't know whether he actually occupied the couch and put the patient in the chair, and whether it went that far, but he believed, he for a while, he was experimenting with what he called mutual analysis. Um, it, it, at times he was very self-revealing about his counter-transference in ways that mainstream psychoanalysis nowadays would not agree with. I mean, we need to understand our counter-transference and we need to acknowledge our errors to patients, but we don't need to bore our patients or use the time they're paying for to tell them all about our mothers. Um, so, you know, uh, Frenzy was a little unstable. Um, he ha had certain tendencies to split. And he would had a tendency to kind of zigzag from one extreme to another. Uh, in Hegelian terms, he would do both thesis and antithesis. I don't think he ever quite reached the synthesis. He had a tr had trouble holding ambivalence, so his thinking is a little back and forth.
but he at least has the courage to uh, open up and explore um, active technique, not just passive technique. Um, I like Ferenczi's um, uh, active technique. I, I, I think that the Freudians, the classical Freudians, were way too passive in their technique. I think at times we have to be actively intervening. Um, um, we have to, some patients require us to be much more engaged, much more talkative, uh, often questioning, actively questioning. Um, um, uh, he 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 try he in his experiments he would um, he would try frustrating. At other times he would become very gratifying, um, really just in an attempt to, uh, to explore um, better, better techniques, more useful techniques. Um, okay, I guess let's, let's turn to the essay, Confusion of Tongues, between the adult and the child. This paper was written in uh, 1932, um, first published in 1933. He died in 1933, so this is his last paper. It's not an easy paper to read, it's, um, but you know, you read it two or three times, you really begin to get it. Confusion of tongues between the adult and the child, the language of tenderness and of passion. Well, the, the title says it. That, that children are speaking in the language of tenderness, and what they want is tenderness. Um, the, uh, this is not the same thing as the adult language of passion. And, and he's saying that sometimes an adult is approached by a child, and the child is all about climbing on you and hugging you and having tender contact with you, but the adult can get turned on by this and can actually misunderstand what the child is all about, and certainly the child cannot understand where the, the adult is coming from, if the adult is coming from a place of passion rather than of tenderness. Um, the night that I gave the Ferenczi talk, there was a very interesting dialogue between two of the distant uh, comments coming from two of the distant participants. Um, uh, one uh, uh, woman sociologist um, asked, and I don't think I can do justice to her question, but she asked something about, you know, when there's a, an interaction between a child and an, and an adult, and the adult is getting sexual gratification from the child, and she didn't mean rape. Uh, she meant more uh, indirect, subtle forms of sensual uh, connection between adult and children. She said, you know, how, do, how can we expect, why do we think that the child knows there's anything wrong with this? Um, because the child may be raised in a community where this is an acceptable form of sexualized interaction between parents and children. Uh, so she's being a sociologist, she's raising the sociological, a sociologically relativist question, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't responding very well to that question, because I'm both a sociologist and a psychoanalyst, and I, I, I reject that relativism, but at that moment I was not finding the words. And um, uh, one of the other distance participants, I think coming from somewhere in the Caribbean? The original, the first speaker was from the Caribbean. Oh, okay. The second lady, I'm not sure. You, I don't know where she was. Uh, okay. But she spoke, of, she spoke of having knowledge of communities where this kind of sexualized interaction between children and adults was considered normative. And, and she said that she's worked with the children and she even though it was normative, the children suffered from shame, hmm. was the point she made. It's, it's she, so that essentially what she was saying was that um, a, a contra-sociological relativism, um, uh, uh, children certainly, I mean, if we're talking rape, they know that pain is bad, but short of that extreme, they know that even though the culture sanctions this kind of sexual use of the child, it leaves them feeling shame. So there's something in the child who, 
who knows? And so putting that into Ferenczi's language, uh, it's as if the child on some level knows that what he wants is tenderness and what he should get is tenderness. And he knows that the adult should approach him from a standpoint of tender love rather than from the standpoint of sexual arousal and passion. The child knows that. Um, I found that interaction very yeah, helpful. You're right. Now that I think of it, it was the Caribbean lady who uh, talked about It was shame. a black lady. Yeah, that's right. And, and she, she was speaking, for, and, and I found what she said so helpful. It cut right to the origin. And that, that interaction between those two perspectives is um, so relevant because certainly those of us who come out of the social sciences are so steeped in cultural relativism and and then there's political correctness you know like we're we're supposed to be very sensitive to the variety of cultural practices and not be ethnocentric right but the point is that even infant research is revealing that um, kids know right from wrong at about three months of age, those, those experiments that we showed the videos of. Uh, so there, there is a core of humanness which is transcultural. And of course that's where I argue that the ethic of don't do to others what you don't want them doing to you comes from. It comes from that same space that allows the child to, to feel shame when the child is being approached in the wrong way by parents mm -hmm. or by adults. Like exploited in other words. The child, is, the child knows when he's being exploited. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so Ferency is trying to get at a lot of this. Um, Ferency opens this article by talking about work with traumatized patients and his hope that he will be able to help these patients by getting them to put their trauma into words, to make it conscious and put it into words. Only he finds out that it isn't working. This hope was not fulfilled, or only imperfectly. The repetition encouraged by the analysis turned out to be too good. Um, the patients began to suffer from nocturnal attacks of anxiety, uh, even from severe nightmares. The analytic session degenerated into an attack of anxiety hysteria. So, I mean, I've had a number of traumatized patients, and I'm trying to get them to put it into words, and they're saying, Don, I can't. I can't, go, I can't leave here and then go back to work. You know, you re by getting me to talk about these things, you know, you're throwing me into something that's going to take me two, three, four days to recover from. This is what he's encountering, okay? Um, and um, uh, so I tried in this embarrassing situation. I tried to encourage myself to console myself that the patient had too much resistance or suffered from such severe repressions that that abreaction could only occur piecemeal uh, but even if the pa over a considerable time these patients didn't change in essentials I had to give rein to self-criticism he says now that's cool okay if things aren't working out the way they're supposed to work out by theory and so Ferenzi goes into a self-critical um, self-study I started to listen to my patients when in their attacks they called me insensitive, cold, even hard and cruel. In other words, he's listening to the negative transference. Um, when they reproached me with being selfish, heartless, conceited, when they shouted at me, help, don't let me perish helplessly, then I began to test my conscience. In order to, instead of setting this aside as negative transference, I just said negative transference, instead of just dismissing it as negative transference, he sets aside his conscience and begin, uh, uh, or tests his conscience, I should say, in order to discover whether, despite all my conscious good intentions, there might be some truth in these accusations. Um, um, I, I, I wish to add that such periods of anger and hatred occurred only exceptionally. Very often the sessions ended with a striking, almost helpless compliance and willingness to accept my interpretations. This, however, was so transitory I came to realize uh, that these willing patients felt hatred and rage, and I began to encourage them not to spare me in any way. Well, look, look, we're only two paragraphs into this article, and we are, we're already seeing a brilliant 
um, shift going on here. Instead of dismissing the patient's hostility um, as nothing but transference, he begins to say, well, am I really being cold in some way? And then he's alert. He's alert to compliance. Uh, this will be very much developed by self-psychology in, 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 in the future. Patients so ready to comply, uh, to stifle the anger, the hatred, and comply, and spare the analyst. Um, so gradually I came to the conclusion that the patients have an exceedingly refined sensitivity for the wishes, tendencies, sympathies, and antipathies of their analyst even if the analyst is completely unaware of this sensitivity. Instead of contradicting the analyst and accusing him of errors and blindness, the patients identify themselves with him. Okay, so now we're into Ferenzi's idea of identification with the aggressor and compliance with the aggressor. Now he's using the term identification with the aggressor very differently than the common sense in which it's understood by Anna Freud and by mainstream psychoanalysis. For Anna Freud, identification with the aggressor means literally that, becoming like the aggressor. So if the aggressor is a sexual abuser and you identify, you the abused will become an abuser. Uh, some, of the, some of the victims in the concentration camps identified with the most sadistic guards and became their assistants. Uh, Anna Freud gives the example of a little girl whose parents are, stay, are, are having dinner at friends and the girl gets sleepy, they put her to bed in an upstairs room and then they hear and they go to the staircase and, and boo, boo, and they ask her what's going on. She explains she's scaring away ghosts. She is a ghost to scare away ghosts. That's identification with the aggressor in the Anna Freud sense. Ferenc, he's talking about something quite different. Uh, he should have named it something different, given it He's talking about a kind of he's talking about empathy. He's talking about a hypervigilant state of attunement to the aggressor, to the abuser, so that you read him instantly because your life depends on it. You find out what he's thinking, what he's feeling, you find out what he wants, and you give it to him quickly. Because if you don't, he might attack you and you might actually die. So this is what he's talking about, how how abused people have, have, he says the abused person becomes a psychiatrist to the abuser. That is, they develop these magnified powers of empathy because so much of their life depends on that. Um, and this is an idea that will be picked up, well, independently by Harold Searles, who in a, an amazing article called The Patient as Therapist to the Analyst, um, uh, the, the patient as therapist to the analyst. Uh, uh, Searles argues that all babies uh, wish to be the therapists of their mothers. Um, and this will be repeated in the analyst. All patients will wish to be the therapist of the analyst. And so, you know, if, if, the, if the baby wants to be the therapist of the mother, there are these three possibilities. Um, um, the one is that the reason I need to be my mother's therapist is to fix her so that she can straighten up and fly right and give me the mothering I need. That's the instrumental explanation. Searle says no. That's not what he's interested. The Kleinians will say the child is the therapist to the mother because in fantasy he's damaged the mother and now he's making reparation for the damage that he imagines he's done in fantasy. Searle says, no, that's not what I'm talking about. He doesn't deny that these two exist. He's just saying that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a third thing. The child is the therapist to the mother because the child simply loves the mother. Mother is unhappy. Mother is anxious. Mother is sad. Baby wants to cheer mother up. Not instrumentally, not to repair, just because you love someone, you want them to be happy. And the child, Searle says, is willing to put his own development on the back burner entirely and devote himself to curing the parent, uh, not for the instrumental, not for the Kleinian, just because <laughs> they love the parent. Um, I think it's a brilliant um, contribution that Searles makes there. Um, Ferenzi is, is, is getting at something a little similar um, about the hyper-attunement of the, of the abused person. 
because their life depended on it. 